Hi everyone, my name is Aaron and welcome back to my channel. This is gonna be kind of a crazy video. I don't think I've packed this much Scientology crazy into one video before. I might have come close in my video, Scientology in the Matrix. Anytime you try to do a deep dive into what Scientologists really believe, you get pretty far down that crazy hole pretty quickly. But this one's gonna be a little special. We'll start off by talking about just a, a light subject on a Monday and uh, I don't know, could it be? Stay I was inspired to do this particular video by a post Jeff Augustine put up on his website, ScientologyMoneyProject.com. In November 2020, Jeff wrote an article on his site called, Did L. Ron Hubbard Consider Himself to be the Antichrist? While I was reading the article, it occurred to me that if someone didn't really understand what Scientologists believe about uh, the afterlife, heaven, hell, or lack thereof, someone might be under the impression that, that maybe that meant Hubbard believed in God, heaven, hell, um, the devil, um, Christ, or the Antichrist. Because if someone didn't believe in all those things, then how is it that someone is saying they are the Antichrist? And in order to explain that, you have to go very deep down the Scientology crazy hole. And that is exactly what we're gonna do. I hope you stick with me through this process. I'm gonna make it as easy as possible. Now, while we jump down this hole, I ask you to keep in mind, not only has Scientology for the longest time tried to portray Scientology as being compatible with Christianity and, and not just Christianity, really every other religion. Recently, for some reason, Scientologists have taken this a step further. And instead of just saying Scientology is compatible with other religions, they've actually gone a further step and started claiming to actually be Christian. Here's one example of Ray Cassano, a high profile local Scientologist in Clearwater where I live, actually claiming in a public meeting. This is a meeting of Clearwater's downtown development board of which Ray Cassano is a member. Here he is in a public meeting. He makes the absurd statement that in fact, most Scientologists are Christians. Well, I am a Scientologist. Yes. I'm also a Christian. Most Scientologists are Christians. So please just keep that in mind as we explore the deep, dark depths of this Scientology crazy hole. To explain a lot of this, I'm gonna be reading directly from a highly confidential issue that L. Ron Hubbard wrote in May of 1980. Scientology has its own rather complicated vocabulary and to read all of this issue would be almost impossible, it would be incomprehensible to people who haven't already spent years in Scientology. So there's gonna be parts of it I leave out. But for the parts I'm going to read to be understandable, we have to start by defining a few terms. The first term I wanna define is OT or operating Thetan. In Scientology, Thetan means spirit. Scientologists believe that we are all spiritual beings. Scientologists uses the word Thetan. Scientologists believe that Thetans are immortal, that Thetans don't actually exist in this physical universe, the physical realm, they exist in what they call the Theta universe. Basically, Scientologists believe that we are all gods, or at least godlike, potentially godlike in our native powers. And yet someone could point out, well, we don't all seem to be godlike. Okay, well, this gets to the definition of operating Thetan. Scientologists believe that only by going up Scientology's bridge to total freedom can you regain your native godlike powers and abilities and the term operating Thetan refers, refers to the upper levels on Scientology's bridge to total freedom, where Scientologists believe they will regain these godlike powers. The bridge to total freedom actually shows 15 OT levels. Only eight of them have ever been released. So if you have a Scientologist who's OT8, they have done as much of the bridge as currently exists. OT8 was released in 1986. Scientologists have been waiting since 1986 for OT9 and 10 to be released. The fact is OT9 and 10 don't really exist. That's why they haven't been released, but I digress. The next definition I wanna define is MEST, M-E-S-T. This stands for matter, energy, space, and time, and is in Scientology is shorthand for the physical universe. If you can see it, touch it, smell it, if it can be measured or weighed, that is the MEST universe. The corollary of the MEST universe is the Theta universe. Scientologists believe that Thetans, or collectively Theta, uh, is a static, it has no wavelength, it cannot be measured, it does not in fact exist in space or time beyond its own decision to place itself in space or time. In this issue that I'm gonna read from, you will hear Theta be referred to, you'll hear MEST be referred to, and that's what that means. The next word I wanna define is implant. In Scientology, this is both a noun and a verb. It is basically artificially inserting 
thoughts, beliefs, or memories into a person's subconscious. The way this is thought of in Scientology is that it's something that can either be done physically or it's something that can be done spiritually. Hubbard talks about implants all the time. It's one of the reasons he was afraid to go to a dentist because he was afraid that while he was under, if he was put under sedation, that somebody would implant him with thoughts, desires, goals, or whatever to throw him off of his game. Hubbard talked a lot about thetans, you know, millions, billions, trillions of years ago, being implanted by hostile alien forces. Hubbard said this was done through some sort of electronic means that the, you know, the thetan would get trapped up in some sort of electronic or magnetic field and something would be done to this thetan to basically give them false ideas, memories, beliefs, um, you know, maybe make them forget things. So this process of implanting, that's what I meant when I said it can be done physically or it can be done spiritually. Scientologists believe you do not have to be inside of your body in order to be implanted. And actually, as an example, what Scientologists believe happens when you die is that your body dies, you as a thetan sort of shoot out of your body, you have already been previously implanted to report to an implant station several of which Scientologists believe exist in various places in this solar system, you as a Thetan are programmed, pre-programmed, to report to the implant station and basically have all of your memory of the life that just ended, to have all of your memory of that life wiped, and then you're implanted, programmed, to shoot back down to Earth jump into a new baby body and live a new lifetime again without any memory that you ever lived before, without any knowledge that you're a spiritual being, without any recollection of your previous 76 trillion years of existence. This is the concept of an implant. The next terms I need to define are incident one and incident two. And defining incident one and incident two requires me to take a quick little step back and explain how the lower half of Scientology's bridge is different from the upper half of Scientology's bridge. On the lower half, otherwise known as the non-confidential half of Scientology's bridge, you are basically told that what's wrong with you is your subconscious mind. And Hubbard called it the reactive mind and the structure of the mind as dictated by Hubbard is not the same as like the Freudian subconscious, but, but they pretty much perform the same function. So on this portion of the bridge, Hubbard is telling you that what's wrong with you and what's wrong with everyone on this planet and the source of all pain and suffering and irrationality and sickness and disease is this subconscious mind. And Scientologists through the auditing on the non-confidential levels are basically trying to erase this subconscious mind and once they have accomplished that, that is what they call the state of clear. Once a Scientologist attests to having achieved the state of clear, they are ready to start the OT levels, the confidential half of Scientology's bridge. The first major level is OT3. OT1 and 2 are just small little things to get you ready for OT3. OT3 is where a Scientologist learns from L. Ron Hubbard and is told for the first time. Oh, by the way, everything we've telling you has been wrong with you up until now. That was kind of bullshit. What's wrong with you is not your subconscious. What's wrong with you is that you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of partially dead, unconscious, sick, crazy thetans stuck to your body. And these thetans have their own reactive minds and their reactive minds are actually What's wrong with you? These thetans on OT3, you learn they're called body thetans. These thetans are controlling your thoughts, your attitude, your state of minds. They're making you sick. They're giving you pains. They're causing any doubts that you have, any insecurities, uncertainties. These are all a result of the reactive minds of these body thetans. And up until now, you've been getting the Scientology auditing but now you have to deliver auditing to all of those body thetans to get rid of their reactive minds. So L. Ron Hubbard, or LRH as I'm just gonna call him, LRH's process for auditing these, these body thetans, or BTs, was to basically run them through what he called incident one and incident two. Now my 30 plus years in Scientology, I never got to OT3. I never did any of this process. I didn't learn about any of this stuff. I didn't know any of this stuff was even a thing until well after I left Scientology. But on this channel, I did an interview with a friend of mine named Joey Chait, and he's similar in age to me, but he did do these OT levels 
when he was in Scientology. And I ask him all about it and he goes into some detail explaining all this. I definitely recommend checking that interview out. Here's how Incident 1 is described. This says, OT3 also deals with Incident 1, set four quadrillion years ago. In Incident 1, the unsuspecting Thetan was subjected to a loud snapping noise, followed by a flood of luminescence, then saw a chariot, followed by a trumpeting cherub. After a loud set of snaps, the Thetan was overwhelmed by darkness. It is described that these traumatic memories alone separate Thetans from their static, natural, godlike state. The idea here is that this weird series of events that, look, if you think that makes no sense, we're on the same page on this. None of this makes any sense. But this weird series of events that a Thetan was subjected to was one of the first um, major milestones in a Thetan falling away from their native godlike status. Incident 2 is what has become more commonly known uh, because of things like South Park. Incident 2 is the Xenu story. Incident 2 occurs much later, only 75 million years ago. Set the scene to 75 million years ago, and here we have the Galactic Confederacy, or as LRH also called it, the Markab Confederacy. Hubbard kind of talked about the Markab Confederacy all the time. The Galactic Confederacy consists or consisted of 26 stars and 76 planets, including Earth, which was then known as Tegiak. He says, various planets united into a very vast civilization which has come forward up through the last 200,000 years, formed out of fragments of earlier civilizations. In the last 10,000 years, they have gone on with sort of a decadent civilization that contains automobiles, business suits, fedora hats, telephones, spaceships, a civilization which looks almost like an exact duplicate but worse off than the current U.S. civilization. That's from 1963 he was saying that. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that these ancient, advanced, alien civilizations just happen to look exactly like the United States that L. Ron Hubbard was living in at the time. The Markabs did have an oppressive political system. Hubbard said that the Markab Confederacy invented income tax as a means of punishment with the death of penalty imposed for making even the slightest mistake on your tax returns. We can see here that in a lecture in 1960, Hubbard stated that the Markab Confederacy was now using Earth as a prison planet. When a person dies or drops the body, his Thetan is pulled into a Markab established implant station, where they are subject to brainwashing and reincarnation. Only Scientologists who reach the status of operating Thetan are said to avoid this fate. By the way, Hubbard said that the 76 planets of the Galactic Confederacy had an average population of 178 billion people. That would make for a population of 9.7 trillion people living in the Galactic Confederacy. So now that we understand the Galactic and Markab Confederacy, we can look to 75 million years ago where Incident 2 occurred. This is the Xenu story. Here's what Hubbard says. Xenu was about to be deposed from power, so he devised a plot to eliminate the excess population from his dominions. With the assistance of psychiatrists, he gathered billions of his citizens under the pretense of an income tax inspection, of course, then paralyzed them and froze them in a mixture of alcohol and glycol to capture their souls. The kidnapped populace was loaded into spacecraft for transport to the site of extermination, planet Earth. When they reached Earth, the paralyzed citizens were offloaded, placed around the bases of volcanoes across the planet. Hydrogen bombs were then lowered into the volcanoes and detonated simultaneously, killing all but a few of the aliens. The now disembodied Thetans were blown into the air by the blast. Don't ask how a Thetan can be blown by a wind or a blast when they're not supposed to exist in the physical universe. They were blown into the air by the blast. They were captured by Xenu's forces using an electronic ribbon and sucked into vacuum zones around the world. The hundreds of billions of captured Thetans were taken to a type of cinema where they were forced to watch a super colossal 3D motion picture for 36 days. Hubbard says that over this 36 day period, various misleading information was implanted into these beings relating to God and the devil. This included all world religions. These belief systems that have evolved over time here on earth, Hubbard is saying that they are just, they're the results of Xenu and his henchmen having intentionally implanted everyone on this planet with these false ideas 
about God and religion. All right, so we've defined a bunch of words now. We've briefly discussed the lower bridge and the upper bridge. Now you know enough that I can at least read directly from most of this document and it will at least make some sense. So now this issue that I'm gonna read from, when Scientologists sat down in 1986 to do OT8 for the first time, this issue was the first item that they read in their OT8 course pack. This is where Hubbard brought up all the Antichrist stuff for the first time. Never before in any other Scientology material had he ever mentioned anything about being the Antichrist. Here's what he says. By the time you read this, I will no longer be occupying the body and identity that you have known as Ron. That identity continues to live in the hearts and minds of many. What follows is a story that has been withheld, for reasons which will soon be obvious, until such time as there were enough OTs that something could be done about it. That time is now. It is not a nice or pretty story, but I trust that having arrived on the OT8 course, you are ready to hear it. You have undoubtedly heard pieces of data over the years that hinted at the greater untold reality of my mission here on Earth. But the story was never written nor spoken in its entirety due to security problems that have unfortunately always plagued the organization. It is only now that I feel it's safe to release the information, although the time is rapidly approaching when I will have no choice in the matter the hour draws that near. Some 80 odd million years ago Earth time, plans were drawn by a group outside the messed universe for the eventual takeover of a good portion of this universe. Not a particularly large or imaginative crew. Their exterior perspective, however, gives them considerable advantage over the time bound beings of the messed universe. This is the first time I'm hearing or reading anything from Hubbard that implies that the um, inhabitants of the Markab Confederacy, maybe themselves, did not occupy bodies. Whenever I've read anything from him, like when I was in Scientology, I always imagined that, well, he said it was a civilization much like here on Earth. So um, I've always imagined the Markabians to be occupying bodies, but you're gonna see here, he's talking about them like just being a spiritual race and for some reason, not being able to directly uh, interact with our messed universe. I'll carry on. They conceived an ongoing implant, some portions of which have been fairly faithfully rendered in parts of the Bible. This implant laid in by carefully controlled genetic mutation at incident two of OT3 and periodically reinforced by controlled historic events since then, makes it effectively impossible for beings on the more heavily affected planets, such as Earth, to become free. It causes progressive genetic evolution, evolution is in quotes, that gives the subject population greater and greater susceptibility to the telepathic impingement and direction of the controllers. In its final stage, the progression becomes almost geometric, and it is this final stage that we are rapidly approaching. So he's drawing a line between the implants that he claims the Markabian civilization laid into the beings that now occupy Earth. He's drawing a line between these implants and the existence of religion. And he's talking about a sort of evolution and he says genetic evolution and evolution is in quotes. You're gonna see later this evolution, this genetic evolution. He's somehow referring to both a physical and a spiritual evolution. Evolution, of course, being in quotes. So really a de-evolution, but almost like the Markhabs planted a seed, part of which was religion, and that that seed has been evolving to make the population more susceptible to control by the Markabians or Markabians, whatever. Okay, LRH goes on, and this is where he really gets into it. No doubt you're familiar with the Revelation section of the Bible, where various events are predicted. Also mentioned is a brief period of time in which an arch enemy of Christ, referred to as the Antichrist, will reign, and his opinions will have sway. All this makes for very fantastic, entertaining reading, but there is truth in it. This Antichrist represents the forces of Lucifer, parentheses, literally the light bearers or light bringer, on parentheses. Lucifer being a mythical representation of the forces of enlightenment, the galactic confederacy. I gotta say, there's something there that's really throwing me off. He's talking about Lucifer being a mythical representation of the forces of enlightenment, the galactic confederacy, but we've already established the galactic confederacy in the world Hubbard envisions is the bad guys. Anyway, I'll keep reading. He goes on. My mission could be said to fulfill the biblical promise represented by this brief antichrist period. During this period, there is a fleeting opportunity for the whole scenario to be effectively derailed, which would make it impossible for the mass Markabian landing 
parentheses, second coming on parentheses, to take place. The second coming is designed, among other things, to trigger a rapid series of destructive events. With the exception of the original Buddhism, virtually all religions of any consequence on this planet, mono and pantheistic alike, have been instruments to spread the progress of this, quote, evolution of consciousness, unquote, and bring about the eventual enslavement of mankind. As you know, Siddhartha Gautama never claimed to be anything more than a man. Having caught on to this operation, he postulated his own return as Matea, part of which prophecy will have been fulfilled upon the passing of L. Ron Hubbard. He refers to himself in the third person there. For those of you whose Christian toes I may have stepped on, let me take the opportunity to disabuse you of some lovely myths. For instance, the historic Jesus was not nearly the sainted figure he has been made out to be. In addition to being a lover of young boys and men, he was given to uncontrollable bursts of temper and hatred that belied the general message of love, understanding, and other typical Markab PR. So even here, he says that even uh, the personality traits that we uh, have come to associate with Jesus was just PR made up by the Markab Confederacy. He's pretty consistent in this. He continues, You have only to look at the history, his teachings inspired, to see where it all inevitably leads. I'm assuming he's referring to like, uh, I don't know, religiously motivated wars or something there. It is historic fact, and yet man still clings to the ideal so deep and insidious is the biologic implanting. See, there's an example of him referring to uh, implanting as a being, having, having a biological basis. He continues, It is a good joke that the Galactic Confederacy is associated with the serpent in the garden, the beast, and other emissaries of the Prince of Darkness. I gotta admit, I don't know what he means when he says it is a good joke, but whatever. Yet in certain passages and esoteric interpretations of the Bible, much of which has been taken out and effectively suppressed for centuries, as well as in the Kabbalah, the truth reveals itself quite nicely for the clever and the ungullible. How I interpret this is that Hubbard is saying that the myth of Christianity is the result of these false ideas, false memories, false beliefs that were implanted into all of our collective beings, and that these implants were designed to cause the consciousness of the human race to evolve, as Hubbard would say, quote unquote, evolve over time, and to create these myths that are the world's major religions. And that over time, these fictitious religious beliefs would evolve to a point where the Earth's population was ready for and expecting and wanting, desiring, the second coming of Christ, but which in reality would be a mass landing of the Markabian invader forces. All right, in this document, Hubbard continues. So it really is a race against time and one that we happen to be losing at the moment as the implant drama inexorably plays itself out in spite of the breakneck pace I've managed to keep up these last 35 years. I will soon leave this world only to return and complete my mission with another identity. Without the biogenetic meddling of those who stand outside of time, who cannot yet directly influence our world, and who must work through others, the dwindling spiral is not nearly as automatic and self-perpetuating as it appears. There are regions, even in isolated parts of the Milky Way, where poets are free to poet, and magicians can paint reality with their magic wands and exteriorize without body kickback. But these areas, unfortunately, are fewer and fewer. I will return not as a religious leader, but a political one. That happens to be the requisite beingness for the task at hand. I will not be known to most of you. My activities misunderstood by many, yet along with your constant effort in the theta band, I will effectively postpone and then halt a series of events designed to make happy slaves of us all. So there you have it. The secret that I have kept close to my chest all these years. And with this briefing, I entrust to each of you the responsibility for this material until such time as I am able to return. This is unbelievable stuff. If I seem surprised by this, I have never read this document before.
until today when I was preparing to do this video. I have never read or heard any of this in all of my time in Scientology. Scientology really is good at keeping its secrets. I was never even under the impression that L. Ron Hubbard was supposed to come back. In fact, I was under the impression of the exact opposite. There was another issue Hubbard had written, and I've taken an excerpt from it here. I'm not gonna bother giving the whole description of this issue. Here's an excerpt of it. You are giving me and you're giving yourselves another giant step on the road to a cleared planet. And someday, uh, way up the line, you'll give yourselves and your friends a cleared planet. And I will go off with you to target two and we will clear another one. And someday, way way up the track, we'll have this universe back in native state and impervious to the faults and traps of yesteryear. Now, I don't know if I have simply been misreading or misunderstanding this excerpt for, you know, 30 years, or if there's something else that I was reading and interpreting that I simply haven't been able to find as I've been looking for it today. But I have always understood Target 2, uh, L. Ron Hubbard's description of going off to Target 2. I have always understood that to be the explanation for why he was not coming back that he, when he died, was gonna go off to Target 2 and get Scientology going on another planet and that we would all join him there once everything was in hand on planet Earth. Every other Scientologist I've ever spoken to about this subject interpreted Target 2 and L. Ron Hubbard going off to Target 2 and not coming back the same way I interpreted it, except for Sea Org members who worked on the international base, they were specifically told that L. Ron Hubbard was coming back. So all the stuff about I'm coming back, I'm gonna be a politician, I need you to basically uh, do these OT levels so that uh, there's an environment where I can pick up a genetically uncontaminated body. This is all brand new shit to me. But what I had seen before or read before or heard before from this issue was the excerpts from this issue about him describing the aspects of religion and that literally religion exists to sort of poison the consciousness of the population of earth to eventually accept and welcome the mass landing and mass invasion by the Markabians at a later point in time. Now consider all that and then consider that not only do Scientologists try to say that Scientology is compatible with Christianity, but now you have Scientologists actually pretending to be Christians. And I guess all of this was just to explain that Hubbard doesn't believe, Scientologists don't believe in God, the devil, heaven, hell, Christ, or the Antichrist. And one of the reasons that Miscavige has sort of tried to model publicly this image that Scientology is um, sympathetic to or compatible with the world's major religions is he wants to create a situation where other religions feel compelled to come to the defense of Scientology in the legal arena. He wants these other groups to see Scientology as sort of a, an ally or being on the same side or being on the same team. He wants those groups to sort of have an emotional reaction to go, we better come to the defense of these guys. Because if these guys come under attack, and if that's allowed, we could be next. Miscavige wants to play on that desire to protect religious liberty, protect religious freedom, by pretending that Scientology is like all of these other things. All right, well, we have covered a ton of ground. We have gone very, very deep down that crazy Scientology hole. I think a deep dive like this really was necessary to truly paint and a really accurate picture for how anti-Christian Scientology really is. In fact, just how anti-religion Scientology really is, despite these appearances that they put up. And to explain how someone like L. Ron Hubbard, who doesn't believe in God, the devil, heaven, hell, Christ, or the Antichrist, could possibly say something like, his presence on earth and his mission fulfills the prophecy of the Antichrist. So anyway, I hope I've done a somewhat decent job of explaining all that. For those of you who have watched until the very end, thank you very much and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. I want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Dream Realty. Oh wait, that's me. I've been a real estate investor for over 20 years. I bought my first investment property when I was 20 years old. For the last 15 years, I've been buying and selling my own properties all over Clearwater and Tampa Bay. If you're looking to buy a home or sell a home and you'd like to work with me, 
Get in touch and I'll get it done for you. Thanks again to everyone who supports this channel and thank you for watching. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye!